In this video, I'm going to introduce the idea of looping using the for statement in Python. What you're looking at is the spider IDE, which as usual I'm running on a Windows instance at Amazon Web Services. Looping using the for statement is the second topic I've discussed in this series of videos that relates to program flow control. Program flow control refers to controlling the sequence that statements are executed in the program. Being able to execute a block of code over and over again and do things like iterate through all of the items in a list is one of the most powerful things that you can do in programming. And the for statement is one of the most important ways of creating a loop in Python. Incidentally, the other topic that we've discussed previously that relates to program flow control was the definition of functions, which we talked about in the second video. If you look over here to the left in the editor window, I have the basic syntax for a loop in Python. The loop starts with the keyword for, and then there is a variable, the word n, and then a collection of things which I've referred to using the term iterable. Now, an iterable is a data object that you can step through, like, for example, a list. And the term iterable is a Python term with a specific meaning. But I don't want you to worry too much about that term right now. Just think about the term iterable as referring to a collection of things that the for statement can step through. The for statement then ends with a colon, which indicates, together with indentation, that a block of code is going to occur. So then we have a whole bunch of statements that are indented, and we signal to Python the end of the block of code that's controlled by the for statement by changing indentation and having a blank line. Now what happens in the for statement is that the variable here is set one by one through the collection of things in this collection referred to here by iterable. So this variable will change each time you go through the code loop to the next item in this collection. That means that the code block here will execute each time with a different value in variable that comes from this collection here in iterable. Now the syntax of the for loop in Python really does focus on having a collection of things and then stepping through that collection of things with variable. And that's a little bit different than some other languages. A rather typical do loop in other languages has the following kind of syntax. Instead of really thinking about a variable stepping through a collection of things, it really thinks about a numerical index. So in this particular code fragment I have here, which is not Python code, the for loop is set up by initializing an index. And the third piece here tells that index how it will be updated at every step. And in the middle here, there's a condition indicating when the for loop should stop. So that's a little bit of a different approach than is taken in Python because it's really focusing on this index i rather than this set. In the for loop in Python, for example, the way you update the variable is to take the next item from the set. And you know how to end when you run out of items in the set. So having given you a little bit of an introduction to the syntax of the for loop, the first thing I'm going to do is create some data, and then we're going to look at an example. So to have some data lists to loop over in our examples, I found an article on the 200 highest paid CEOs in 2014. And the first list I have created is the name of those 200 CEOs. So I have put this list definition in a cell. Recall that a cell is defined by pound percent percent. And I can execute the definition of this list just by selecting anywhere in the cell and then typing control enter. And you'll see that the definition of the list has executed now over here in the console window on the right. So let's just quickly check 
that we got all of the data by asking for the length of the CEO's list. And you'll see that the length of the CEO's list is 200 as it should be. Now I also have a list of just the CEO's first names. And I'm going to go ahead and create that list as well. This list is also in a cell, so I can select anywhere in the cell and do Control Enter to execute it. So now I have another list of the CEO first names. So let's just go ahead and quickly check its length. And that is also 200. And then finally, I have a list of the CEO last names. So again, I'll just go ahead and quickly execute this cell of code in order to define that list. And one more time, I'll check that it has the correct length. And sure enough, it has length of 200. So I now have three lists defined. One list is a list of all of the CEO names. The second list is a list of just their first names. And the last list is a list of their last names. And each one of those lists has a length of 200. Now given what we know about Python so far, we really do not have a very convenient way to select an arbitrary set of items out of a list. We learned earlier about ways to slice a list, but picking an arbitrary set of indices is a different thing than slicing. So as our first example of using for loops, I'm going to create a function called getItems that will allow you to pull out an arbitrary set of indices from a list. So I'm going to move on down in the editor window to a blank cell. So just so that you understand what this function is supposed to do, I'm going to show you how the function works before I show you how to define it. So for example, suppose I wanted the first, third, and 15th CEOs in the list. What I'd really like to have is a function, for example, called getItems, where I can specify the list that I want, CEOs, and then specify as a list the ones that I want. And I think I said I wanted the first, the third, and the 15th. So if I enter 1, 3, and 15 as a list, and close the parentheses, and now hit Enter, I should get the names of the first, third, and 15th CEOs. So that's Michael Fries, Satya Nadella, and Joshua Sapan. My apologies to these CEOs because I really don't know how to pronounce their names and have probably butchered them. But in any case, that shows you the kind of functionality I want in my function. That is to give it a list and a list of indices and have a list returned that only consists of the values at the items specified. So to create this function, I start with def and then the function name getItems. And then the first argument to this function should be an input list. And the second argument should be an index list. Now you recall that when I define functions, I end this first line with a colon, indicating that a block of code is about to follow. So what I'm going to do in this function is step through the items in the index list and then save the corresponding items from the input list into a list which I will return as the function's output. So the very first thing I'm going to do is define an empty list that will contain the output. So I'm going to say out is equal to open square bracket, close square bracket, and that will define an empty list. Now the next thing I'm going to do is step through the index list. So now I use the for statement and I need to specify a variable that I'll use to step through the index list. So I'm just going to call that item. And then I go in, and now I specify my collection that I'm going to step through. So that's going to be the index list. And the for statement ends with a colon, which indicates that a new block of code is about to be entered. And so what I need to do is take my list out, which begins empty, and I need to append the item 
of input list that is at the index indicated by the current value from index list and that's an item. So again what these two statements do is as follows. Index list is a list of the items that I would like returned. Item will step through that index. I created an empty list out for my output and every time I step through a value in index list I append to this empty list out the value from the input list that occurs at item. So the last thing I need to do is return from my function the list out. And this function as it's defined should take any input list and return the indices specified in the index list. Now before I continue I want to point out that I do absolutely no error checking in this function as I've written it at all. For example, I don't check that the indices in index list are really integers or that they're within the range of integers that index items in the input list. Writing bulletproof code for public consumption is hard. I am just writing this function right now just as an illustration of how the for statement works. So I'm a, giving myself a great deal of slack with respect to checking the validity of inputs to the function. So let's go ahead and define this function in our current Python session in the console. So this function is defined in its own cell and I can select anywhere in that cell and then do control enter to run the function. So let's go ahead now and see if our function get items works. If I do get items and then the first argument is the CEO names, which is in the list called CEOs, and then the items that I want, 1, 3, and I don't know, 15. Don't remember what I used before. Let's see what happens. I get uh, Michael Fries, Satya Nadella, and Joshua Sapan, which I believe was exactly the items before. So again, in reviewing this function, I define the function with an input list and an index list. I created an empty list for the output. I stepped through all of the items in the index list and then appended to the output list the input item at that location. And then finally, I returned out. So this is my most basic example of using the for loop and what we've implemented is something that is very useful, a way of pulling an arbitrary set of items out of a list. So as a final example in this video, I want to look at a situation where it is more natural to iterate over an integer index than it is really over a collection of items. This example will be consistent with how looping is conceptualized in a lot of computer languages that are earlier than Python. In these earlier languages, looping was conceptualized to be more consistent with the way summation notation is used in mathematics. The example I'm about to do here is also an example that is more consistent with the kinds of computations that you're likely to be trying to do in analytics. And in particular, what I'm going to do is create functions to compute the correlation between two lists. So these lists would have to be numerical values. And I'm going to look at kind of a silly example. I'm going to see if the length of the CEO's first name correlates with the length of their last name. One might reasonably make a hypothesis that people who have long first names also tend to have long last names. And before I get into this example, I'm just going to remind you of the formulas that are involved in computing a sample correlation. To compute the sample correlation between two variables, you're going to need the sample mean for each variable, the sample standard deviation for each variable, and the sample covariance between the variables. The formula for the sample mean is, of course, the sum of the observations divided by the number of observations. So for math, we have the capital sigma notation here, which means the sum and then an index which runs from 1 to the number of observations. 
And this just means add up all of the x sub i's for i running from 1 to n, and then divide by the total number of observations n. So I hardly needed to tell you all of that, but I just want to point it out because of the parallel between this summation notation and the way looping was originally conceived in computer languages. Now the formula for the sample standard deviation is as follows. First you take every observation and then you subtract the sample mean. And you take that difference and square it and then you add up all of those squared differences starting with the first one and then going all the way through the data so the sample size is again n. You take that sum of squared deviations from the mean and you divide it by the number of observations minus 1 and then finally you take the square root to get the sample standard deviation. The sample standard deviation is denoted often by the letter s or by sigma hat. And I've put a subscript here of x just to indicate that this is the sample standard deviation of the data represented by x. So to compute the sample covariance between two variables, you use the following formula. And what this formula says is that you take each of the x values and you subtract the mean of the x values x bar. And you do the same thing for the y's as well. You take each y value and you subtract the mean of the y's. You then multiply these two differences together and then sum those from 1 up to the total number of observations. Finally, you take that sum and you divide it by the sample size n minus 1. The sample covariance is often denoted by using the letter s with a subscript for each of the variables, so this indicates that this sample covariance is between x and y. And another notation that's commonly used is sigma hat sub xy. We're now in a position to compute the sample correlation, and what the sample correlation is, is it is the sample covariance between the two variables divided by the sample standard deviation of each of the variables. And the sample correlation is often denoted by R, and again I have the subscripts X and Y here to indicate which variables this correlation is between. And sometimes the Greek letter rho is used, so rho hat sub XY is another notation used for the sample correlation. The sample correlation measures the linear association between the two variables and it's scaled so that it ranges between a negative 1 and a positive 1. A sample correlation of plus 1 or minus 1 indicates a perfect linear relationship and a correlation of 0 indicates no relationship between the variables. So returning to Python, the first thing I'm going to do to compute the sample correlation is to begin by defining a function that computes the sample mean. So I'm going to call that function mean, and I have its definition in this cell. So mean is going to take a list of values, which I've called data, as its argument. And the first thing that happens is that I take the length of that list of data and store it in n. So that's the sample size. Next, I'm going to use a for loop to add up all the values in data and I need to accumulate them into a variable. I've called that variable ants for answer and I initialize that variable to zero. Now in the for loop, the variable x is going to step through all of the values in the data list one at a time and then these values are accumulated into answer using this statement here with the funny plus equals. Plus equals is a shorthand notation for the following. What it means is that you take the variable on the left hand side, in this case answer, and then you add to it the variable on the right hand side. And then you store the result back in answer. So the plus equals says that you take the variable x and you add it to answer and then store it back in the same place. So I'm now going to go ahead and delete this extra line of code I put in here as an explanation of the plus equal notation.
Finally, once I've added up all of the values in data, I need to divide those by the sample size. And I do that in this line that uses this divide equals notation that works in exactly the same way as the plus equals notation. What it means is that I take the value in the variable on the left hand side, I divide it by the variable on the right hand side, which in this case is n, and then I store the result back into the variable indicated on the left hand side. So what this statement does is it takes the sum in answer, divides it by n, and puts it back in answer. And then finally I return the variable ants, which should contain the sample mean. Next I define a similar function to compute the sample standard deviation, and I've called this function sd. And as with the sample mean, it takes as its argument a list containing the data values. The first thing I do with that list is to compute its sample average, which I've called x bar, and the next thing is to save the sample size into n, and the sample size of course is just the length of data. Now I have a for loop that's quite similar to what we just did for the sample mean. Again I'm going to accumulate the answer in the variable ants, and I initialize that with the value of 0. In the for loop, the variable x is just going to step through all of the data values, but this time what I need to accumulate is each of the data values minus the sample average, all of that squared. And I'm once again going to use this plus equal notation, which says that I take the value and answer, and then I add to it the value here on the right hand side, which is the square deviation of the observation from its mean, and I save that back into the variable answer. So once the for loop is complete, I will have accumulated the sum of square deviations from the mean. Now in the sample standard deviation, I need to take that sum and divide it by n minus 1, which I do in the next statement, and then finally I need to take its square root, which I've done in the last statement here. And then to complete the function, I need to return that answer. Now in the two functions that I've created so far, mean and sd, I have not used an index as in the summation notation in the formulas to step through the data. Rather, I've been able to use the for loop to step through the data directly. But in the formula for the covariance, I need to step through both the x data and the y data at the same time. And probably the easiest way to do this is to have the for loop step through an index and use the index to pull the correct items out of the x list of data and the y list of data. So that raises the question of how you step through indexes in for loops in Python. And the answer to that is that you use a function called range. And what the range function does is it creates a list of integers that an index can now step through in a for loop. And the way it works is as follows. If you do the range of an integer like 10, it returns a list of values 0 up to 1 minus the number that you put in here. So in this case it would be 0 up to 9. So let's see what this gives us when we run it. So I'm going to run it with F9 and you'll see it gives us the list of integers 0 all the way up through 9. Now Python does this, as is probably obvious to you, because lists are indexed starting at 0 and going all the way up through 1 less than the length of the list. So for example, if we do the range of the length of the CEO names, let's go ahead and execute that with F9, what I'll get is a list of integers that starts at 0 and goes all the way down to 199, one less than the length of CEOs, which is 200. The final notation that I have here for the range actually has two arguments, and when you give the range two arguments, it starts with the first number and goes all the way up to one less than the 
number in the second position here. So in this particular case, the length of CEOs again is 200. So this range should start at 50 and go all the way up to 199. So let's check what it does. So we can see that it went all the way up to 199. Let's go up and see if it started with 50. And there it is. Now we're in a position to use the range function in looping over an index. And I'm going to use this idea of looping over an index in defining my final function core, which computes the correlation. The core function takes two arguments, x and y, and each of these arguments is going to be a list of the corresponding values. x is a list of the x values and y is a list of the y values. So to compute the correlation, the first thing I need are the sample averages of both the x and the y values and I compute those in these first two statements and store them into x bar for the sample mean of the x's and y bar for the sample mean of the y's. And I did this using the mean function which I defined earlier. The next thing I need to save is the sample standard deviation for the x's and for the y's. And I've done that in the next two statements using the sd function that I just defined. And I've stored that in a variable sdx and another variable sdy. Now I need a for loop in which I accumulate the sum of the product of the deviations of the x's and the y's from their mean. So I'm going to define a variable co for covariance and I'm going to initialize it to zero and I'm going to use it to accumulate the sum. Now I have my for statement but in this case my variable here in the for statement I'm going to call i because it's representing an index in a manner very similar to the index in mathematical summation notation. But i needs to step through a collection here and the collection that I'm going to use is the range of the number of observations. I can get the number of observations from the length of x. So the length of x is n, and the range of the length of x is going to start at 0 and go all the way up to n minus 1. Now what am I accumulating? Well, firstly I'm going to use the plus equal notation, but the thing that I'm accumulating is the product of the differences of the x and y values and their means. To compute these products, I'm going to need for each index value i, the ith value from the x list. So I'm now subscripting x. So it's capital X, open square bracket, i, close square bracket. I subtract from that the sample mean for the x's and then put that in parentheses. I multiply that by the same thing for the y's. So again, I'm using the index to pull the correct value out of the y list. And then I subtract the mean of the y's. I put that in parentheses and then I multiply together those two deviations from the mean and then that is added into the cove variable. So this example shows why the index approach is both useful and natural. And the reason is that we need to step through two lists at the same time. A natural approach for this is suggested by mathematical summation notation and that is to step through an index instead and then retrieve the required values from the two lists by using the index to reference them. The next step in calculation of the correlation is to compute the covariance by taking the sum of the products of the deviations, which is now the value in the cove variable, and dividing it by n minus 1. So again, I've used the slash equal notation to do the division, and then I have the length minus 1, which is n minus 1 on the right-hand side. The final thing that I need to do to compute the correlation is to take this covariance that I've now computed and divide it by the standard deviation of each variable. So I have done that and stored the value which should now be the correlation in ants, and then I return the answer. So the last thing to do in this video is to actually run the example. And I need to begin by defining in the console 
the functions we have created. So each of these functions was written in a cell. So I can execute all of the code in that cell by selecting anywhere in the cell and doing control enter. So over here in the console you can see that the mean function has now been defined. Next I will define the standard deviation function in the same way. And there's the standard deviation function. And then finally I'll define the core function which computes the correlation. So there in the console is the definition of the core function. So I'm now going to compute our example which was to compute the correlation between the length of the CEO first names and the length of the CEO last names. The idea there is that a person who has a long first name may also have a long last name or vice versa. But in order to do that, I need a way of computing the length of each of the CEO first names. And I'm going to begin by reminding you that there is a built-in function len for length, which will compute the length of a string. So for example, the length of A, B, C, D will come back as 4. So if I could apply the length function to all of the strings in the lists of CEO first names and last names, I'd have the numbers that I would need for the correlation function. Well, it turns out that in Python there is a, another built-in function called map, which will apply a function to all of the items in a list. So for example, if I do map and then the first argument is the function, so map open paren len, and then the list that I want to apply the function to, so CEO first names, what I'll get as the returned value is a list of the results of the function applied to each of those CEO first names, which in this particular example will give us a list with each of the first names lengths. So let me go ahead and execute that line of code with F9. And what you'll see is I get a list out here that has these integers that indicate the length of those names. And there will be 200 integers in that list. So now finally I'm in a position to compute the correlation between the lengths of the first names and the lengths of the last names. I can just use the correlation function and then map. And the function I'm going to map in both cases is len. And so I use map of len of the CEO first names as the first argument in core, and then the map of len to the CEO last names as the last argument. And so now if I run this line, I'll get the correlation between the length of the CEO first names and the length of the CEO last names. So we see that the correlation is negative 0.0448 approximately. So there's a very, very slight negative correlation. This correlation is so close to zero. What it's really showing us is that there is no relationship between the length of the CEO first names and the length of the CEO last names. So this concludes my introduction to looping in Python using the for statement. Looping is obviously incredibly important in computer programming. And I've provided two examples, one which involves stepping through a set, and another which might be considered a more traditional example that involves looping using an index.